All right, well, if you have a Bible with you, open up to, not Colossians, uh, but to Philemon. So Philemon is a small little letter in the New Testament. Uh, Last week, we wrapped up Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, to the Christians living in the ancient city of Colossae. But as Paul's ministry partners and friends named Tychicus and Onesimus that he named in the, at the end of his letter, uh, as they carried that letter to Colossae, it wasn't the only letter in their mailbag. There was another letter inside, and that letter was addressed to a man named Philemon. Philemon was a member of the Colossian church. So, I thought, you know what, hey, it'd be kind of cool for us to finish Colossians, but then look at something else going on in the church at Colossae, and what is it that's going on? Why does it deserve a letter from Paul to a specific person about a specific issue? It must be pretty important. Well, today is kind of a little bit of a follow-up to our series through Colossians. It's going to be a two-part sermon. So today and next Sunday, we're going to look at this small book of the New Testament named for the person it's written to, Philemon. Well, before we dig into that, let me pray, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you so much for just the wonderful opportunity we've already had this morning to worship, Lord, to spend time in community with each other, Lord, in our groups this morning, but also, Lord, just being able to now hear your word. So I pray that you would speak to us Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Change the way we think about ourselves, about you, about others around us. Align our hearts with yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as we discovered in our study of Colossians, the central theme of that letter was that Christ is enough, right? Christ is enough. We don't have to look to anything else in this world. We don't have to look for any other kind of ultimate meaning or peace in this world. Christ should be enough for us in every area of our lives. But how does that truth apply to our interpersonal relationships and our friendships? How does the fact that Christ is enough for us, how does that apply to the conflict that we often have with others in different ways and varieties in our lives. Well, that is what Paul's letter to Philemon is really about. This letter to Philemon really serves as kind of a case study, if you will. It's a case study for the letter to Colossians because it shows how Jesus and his gospel can transform the relationships in our lives. Now, This letter is a little tricky to interpret because Paul is addressing a situation that is already happening. And we're not given many details about the backstory of this and and what the history of this is. So we're also not told how this story ends. (laughs) So as one commentator, uh, David Garland, I was reading, he, he put it this way. I thought this was very accurate. He said, it's kind of like coming into a movie theater in the middle of the movie and having to catch up on who the characters are and what's already happened in the plot, and then you have to, then you get a call and you have to leave before the movie's over, all right? So that's kind of like reading the letter to Philemon. You walk into it and you're like, what is Paul talking about? Who is this guy named Philemon? And then you have to leave before you find out how the situation is resolved. So because of that, we're going to do this a little backwards today. I want to explain some of that backstory and then we'll read the letter in its entirety so it makes a little more sense in our minds. All right, so this letter uh, really involves three people. All right, so you've got the Apostle Paul, who is the author, right? He's the one writing the letter from his imprisonment in Rome. So he's in prison in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. He's writing to Philemon, okay? But the letter is really about someone named Onesimus. Now, if you recall last week as we finished Colossians, 
Paul mentioned this guy named Onesimus in chapter 4 of Colossians. He and Tychicus are the ones actually sending this letter. They're carrying the letter uh, to, to Colossae. So we know about Paul. We know about him and, and his ministry. But, but who are these other two guys? Who are Philemon and Onesimus? Well, Philemon is a faithful Christian. All right, He's a good Christian person. He lives in the city of Colossae, as I said, and Paul clearly respects him, as we're going to see later on as we read this. Philemon was a wealthy man. He was a wealthy man, but he had a good reputation amongst everyone. He was very generous to others, and he probably had a pretty big house because he actually hosted the, the church in Colossae in his home. So you got to keep in mind, right, in the first century, there were no church buildings, all right? And a lot of that was political because the Roman Empire frowned upon Christians, of course, and they were, they were persecuted. So, so Christians could not have any kind of church building to meet in like we have today and we're blessed with. They had to actually meet in people's homes. So Philemon hosted the church in his house. So great guy, all right? Who is Onesimus? Well, Onesimus was Philemon's bondservant. Now, what is that? What is a bondservant? Well, we actually talked about this a few weeks ago because Paul addressed bondservants in his letter to the Colossians. He may have had Onesimus in mind, but I want to read something uh, from the ESV study Bible that explains this a lot better than I can. It's a really good explanation of what a bondservant was. So a bondservant, it says, was someone in the Roman Empire officially bound under contract to serve their master for seven years. When that contract expired, the person was freed, given their wage, and that, uh, that had been saved by their master, and then they would officially be declared free, all right? So it also tells us that a bondservant was an integral part of the family, So the NIV translation uses the word slave, and this is not the same thing that we think of, of the horrific and terrible, evil, wicked slavery in North America in centuries past. This is not the same thing. This is very different, all right? But nonetheless, they were still working in a home for that, under that contract, earning their wage, uh, but they were considered an integral part of the family. Okay, so... Onesimus is that, all right? He is a bondservant. He is Philemon's bondservant. But what happened, what happened to warrant a letter from the Apostle Paul, right? Something pretty big must have happened. Well, most commentators or many commentators agree that Onesimus most likely stole money from Philemon and ran away. All right, that's probably what happened in this situation, given some context clues and what we know that happened in the first century. Onesimus probably stole money from Philemon and then fled to Rome. Now, Rome was about 1,300 miles from Colossae. So this is a long journey in the ancient world, right? That's a big deal. So this is a big deal because Onesimus, he would have been considered, like I said, an integral part of the family. And this truly would have been an act of betrayal, a big one. It would have hurt Philemon and probably caused him just the personal hurt of Onesimus betraying him, the financial loss that he would incur, but also social embarrassment. So there's a lot of different variables happening here, but in the Roman In the ancient Roman Empire, this crime was very serious. It was a serious offense, and it could possibly end in Onesimus' death. He could be killed for this. So, Onesimus is basically a fugitive hiding out in the big city of Rome, hoping to go undetected, very far away from Colossae. (laughs) Now, side note, ironically, the name Onesimus means useful. It means useful. The ESV study Bible says by stealing from Philemon and running away, Onesimus had become useless. Now, Paul's going to use in verse 11 here, in just a minute, we're going to see this. He's going to use his name as a play on words. Onesimus, who was called useful, is now useless until, until he met someone in the city of Rome. 
someone named Paul. Now, (laughs) you know how sometimes when maybe you're on vacation or even just somewhere here in Jacksonville around town and you run into a stranger and you meet them for whatever reason through work or a mutual friend and you get to talking and you realize that you both know somebody Right, You both know someone, you're like, oh my gosh, I know that person, we grew up together, or oh yeah, you, how do you know them? Right? It, it's just weird and awkward for a little while, but it's cool because you realize you both have a friend in common. Well, apparently, that's what happened to Onesimus when he met Paul. Oh, you're Paul. Yeah, I've heard about you. Yeah, I know Philemon. I stole his money and ran away, right? Like there is probably some awkwardness there in that conversation. But Onesimus somehow ran into Paul in the huge city of Rome. And guess what? Paul shared the gospel with him. Get this. Onesimus accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So... The ESV study Bible says now he had become useful, (laughs) useful again, but living up to his name in a different way, right? Not for monetary profit, but for spiritual profit. So Onesimus is now a Christian. But what about the things he did? What, What about his relationship to Philemon and his family and everyone back in the Colossian church? What about what about the wrong he had done? Isn't he contractually obligated to fulfill his service to Philemon? And beyond that, I mean, what's the right thing to do? Should Onesimus return, travel those 1,300 miles back, return the money to Philemon and and serve him again? What, What should Onesimus do? What is the right thing? And if he does return, what should Philemon do? Again, it was not uncommon for a runaway bondservant to be punished by death. So how should Philemon treat Onesimus if he returns? Well, guess what? Now we're in the middle of the movie, all right? You want to read the letter? Let's do it, all right? Here we go. The short letter to Philemon from the Apostle Paul as he writes. We're just going to read the whole thing. Now you kind of know the context, so let's go. Verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner, also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner... Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. 
Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. And I love that, by the way. Paul just like, by the way, I'm coming for a visit, so please get the house ready. Right? Verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This short little letter tucked away in your Bible in the New Testament, it's kind of easy to overlook, isn't it? It's a little easy to overlook, but I believe God included this little letter in our scriptures because it is such an amazing, real life story of the power of the gospel to transform lives and to teach us about what it really, really means to be forgiven, to forgive, and to be reconciled. So to understand those concepts, it's going to take us this week and next, I want us, I want us to look at this from the vantage point of each of those three main characters, Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. All right. So next week, we're going to spend a lot more time next week looking at the actual dynamic between Philemon and Onesimus and how they should treat one another. But today, I want us to look at things a little differently. I want us to look at them from Paul's perspective. What is Paul's involvement in this matter? Let's talk about that. What did Paul really believe? You see, whatever Paul believed about this matter would determine the action, right? Because you know what? Belief drives behavior. Whatever you believe about something is exactly why you do the things you do, whether they're serious or not. So for example, Christy and I, my wife Christy, we have a, uh, we have a family member who I will not name. All right, we have a family member who believes that he has to wear tennis shoes every time he flies on an airplane. Now, I've asked him about this. Now, why, why is that, right? Why do you do Well, you know, in case the plane crashes. And I'm thinking, I don't, you know, if the plane's going down, right, I don't think we're going to look around the cabin in the plane and be like, well, hey, we're all okay. We're wearing tennis shoes, right? We're good, right? It's no problem, guys. Don't worry, right? I don't understand it. Again, I'm not going to tell you who this is, but whatever, all right? So, <laughs> but that's his belief. And so every time he rides on a plane, I mean, I prefer tennis shoes on a plane too, but not for that reason. So he believes that. And guess what? He does that, okay? So here's the thing. When you believe something, as weird as it may be, right, whatever it may be, guess what? That drives your actions. Whatever you believe in your heart about any kind of situation, that is why you do the things you do. Your behavior is driven by these beliefs. That is true for Paul. As he is writing this letter, he is thinking about what is most important in the belief of the scriptures and what God has commanded us to do. And that is what's driving him to say the things he's saying to Philemon. So the first thing we see Paul believing here is that he believed in the power of the gospel to change lives. Paul really believed in the power of the gospel to change lives. Romans chapter 1, Paul says this very clearly. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for everybody. You see, Paul, Paul would not have been Paul would not have bothered sharing the good news of Jesus with a runaway fugitive if he didn't think this guy could truly be changed. Why bother? If he thought that Odysseus was too far gone, too evil, too wicked, has done too much bad, hurt too many people, if Paul believed that that was not, that he was too far gone and that God's grace was not enough for him, he wouldn't have bothered to share the gospel. But Paul didn't think Onesimus, a betrayer and a thief, was too far gone. Paul didn't think Onesimus was out of the reach of God's grace and forgiveness. He, he may have been 1,000 miles away from his problem, hiding from Philemon, 
But Paul believed that Onesimus could not hide from God's grace. Like Paul, do we believe that? Like, do we really believe the gospel can save anybody? Like, do we really believe that about our enemies, about the people that we don't like? Whether it's personal, whether it's in public, a group of people, if there's someone that you have a problem with, why is that? And why is it that maybe deep down in your heart, you don't believe that they can really know Jesus? And so you don't even make an effort to reach out to them in some kind of loving relationship and friendship, right? It's just, an, it's just avoidance. The Bible is full of stories who had, of people who had committed terrible things, terrible sins. I mean, seriously, the Bible is full of people who did terrible things, full of people with shady pasts, full of people who were outcasts in society. But people, these people turned to God. They turned to Jesus Christ for salvation by admitting, admitting their sin, their uselessness, as Onesimus was called, and running to God for forgiveness. Paul was willing to take the time to share this hope of God's love and forgiveness through Jesus with Onesimus. And are we doing that? Are we taking the time to do that with the people in our lives who we are tempted to give up on? And Think about this. Paul also believed the gospel, it's not only the power to save, to bring someone into relationship with God, but also to change them, right? To transform their lives. Paul would not have asked Onesimus to go back to Philemon unless he thought that both men could truly be transformed by God's grace so that they could forgive one another and be reconciled to each other. If Paul didn't believe that was possible, he would not have asked Onesimus to go back. You see, we must believe that relationships can be restored. We must believe that the power of God's forgiveness can be evident in us towards those who have wronged us. This is not easy. And honestly, it's kind of, it's kind of a lot of trouble, you know? Isn't it kind of a lot of trouble, trouble to, to put ourselves through the pain and the risk of, of getting this right and of granting forgiveness and, and seeking forgiveness from someone? But like Paul, we must believe it's worth the trouble. That living out God's truth and putting his grace on display in our lives, that that's worth it. But you have to really believe in the power of the gospel so that you can do this and take those risks. Paul's belief is so strong. It's so strong that he even states that, you know, he thinks God orchestrated this whole thing. God or Paul, I should say, believes God orchestrated this whole thing, that God's hand was in this from the start. Look what he said in verse 15. He said, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. In other words, Paul's saying, maybe all of this happened for a reason. And of course, God is the one in that reason. Maybe, maybe Onesimus is, has been departed from you, has left you so that you guys could actually be reconciled as brothers. Not as a master and a bondservant, but as equals. In other words, Paul's belief in God's power is so strong that he believes God wanted to reconcile Onesimus and Philemon in a way that would last forever. Not temporary under some kind of contract, but spiritually, eternally forever. God wanted to bring salvation to Onesimus. He wanted to form a bond of brotherhood between these men that would last forever. We must, just like Paul, we must believe in the power of the gospel to actually change people's lives. If we don't really believe that, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Just checking off some kind of religious box on our list? If we don't believe that Jesus Christ can change anybody's life, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror at who we are, the things you've done, your shady past, my shady past, all of us, all of us, equally undeserving of God's grace. 
Paul believed. We must believe. Jesus can change anybody. Number two, Paul believed that discipleship happens best in community. Paul believed that growing in your faith in the Lord happens best with other Christians. Look what he says in verse 10. He says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Now this is interesting familial language, right? He's using the language of family, my child, my father. Of course, he's speaking metaphorically there. Paul led Onesimus to faith in Christ. And what an awesome opportunity, right? What an awesome privilege that Paul had to be able to share the gospel with Onesimus, and then Onesimus actually believed, right? He heard it, he received it, he believed, he turned from his sin, he trusted Jesus to be his savior. It's an amazing event. He saw himself then, Paul saw himself right, as Onesimus' spiritual father, so to speak. And that shows us that, that Paul, Paul is owning the responsibility to see to it that Onesimus is discipled, right? That means to grow in your faith, right? Paul wanted to make sure that Onesimus was going to not just flounder, right? All right, I did that, I, I committed to Christ, and, and now I'm just going to kind of flounder and float around, right? No, Paul wanted Onesimus to thrive. He wanted him to continue to grow and to make things right in his life and to love Jesus and love the Bible and obey God's command so that he can grow and love God and love others. So we must see, we see, right, from Paul's example that this discipleship process, this growth in the Lord is personal, but it's also interconnected. It's interconnected with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We all need a spiritual father. We all need a spiritual mother. We all need a spiritual child, so to speak. In other words, we should all be sharing the gospel and leading people to Christ in a way that forms Christian bonds and friendships for lifetime. In other words, we should all be concerned. We should all be concerned in a good way about each other's walk with Christ. We should all desire for each other to grow in our faith and become more like Jesus. Notice something at the beginning, the very beginning of this letter. What Paul says in verse 1 and 2, he says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, that's probably Philemon's wife, by the way, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Archippus very well could have been the pastor of the small church meeting in Philemon's house. But look what he says. And the church. Now that's, that's interesting that Paul addresses this letter to Philemon, probably his wife and his pastor, but also the whole church. <laughs> I mean, the very fact, right, that Paul is also addressing everybody means that everybody, right, should work toward unity and love in this particular situation. Now, so this letter, this letter not only holds Philemon accountable to do the right thing, but everybody in the church, right? Everybody in that little church meeting in Philemon's house, they're all reading this publicly in that scenario, right? They're all reading this, and they're all saying, whoa, like, Philemon, you should, you should forgive. You should forgive Onesimus. Onesimus, you should make things right with Philemon, right? Everybody is in this together. Now, in a matter that some would say, right, some would say, well, this is nobody else's business, right? This is a private matter between Philemon and Onesimus, and, and they just need to work it out amongst themselves. But see, it's easy to say that, but Onesimus was Philemon's bondservant. He stole money and ran away. So whenever they were having church at their house, I mean, people would see Onesimus. He would probably be serving them in some way. So it's very awkward to not bring it up, especially if Onesimus walks back in the house, Right? I mean, if he just walks back in the door after being gone for however long, like, hey, guys, I'm back. Well, this is awkward, right? I mean, everybody in the church needs to know about this. So it is a public matter. Now, we don't need to go too far with this idea because this is a public matter in a small church meeting in somebody's house. So, of course, it needs to be addressed to everyone. But the point is, the point is, everyone is responsible. Everyone is responsible to do the right thing, and everyone is responsible to learn from this. It's a teachable moment. This communal mindset to spiritual growth, it allows each of us to encourage one another. Right? The church, 
right, a local church, so we don't meet in a house, right? I don't think anybody's house is big enough for all of us to go inside, but if you want to have us over later, let me know, right? So <laughs> we'll just grill some hot dogs, all right? All of us, right, we fit into this room together, and we call ourselves a church. Praise God for the gift of the church, right? I'm so thankful and happy that Jesus gave us the idea, right? He gave us the institution of church. What is it? It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not just like a religious organization, non It's a No, it is the body of Christ. It's a spiritual bond that unites us and holds us together. So this, this idea, this is not my idea, it's not yours, it's not any man's idea. This is Jesus Christ's invention, The church is his, it's his body, it's his bride. That's why the Bible uses those intimate metaphors to describe the church, because it belongs to Christ. The church, right, having this mindset that we're all in this together, that spiritual growth allows each of us to encourage one another to obedience and to Christ-likeness. When you form those kinds of relationships within the church, it allows us to deal with situations properly in our lives with truth and love with the encouragement of knowing others are with you you're not alone you are not alone we saw this last week in the conclusion to Colossians right Paul named 11 different people (laughs) he named 11 different people who were all interrelated on the same team all contributing to each other's walk with Christ somehow That's what we have in the local church. That's what we have in our community groups on Sunday mornings in a more, even more intimate way. Paul knows that it's that kind of context that will provide the space and the ability for someone like Philemon and someone like Onesimus to be reconciled, to grow as brothers in Christ together, and for the church to love them and support them in their reconciliation. So it's very clear here for Paul, it should be clear for us today, discipleship, spiritual growth happens best in the context of Christian community. Don't walk with Christ alone. Walk with others. Number three, and lastly, Paul believed forgiveness was costly. Paul believed forgiveness was not free. Now let's be clear This isn't easy. This isn't easy for anybody in this story. This is costly for everybody involved. There's a lot. A lot happened. A lot went down. Think about it. I mean, this is difficult for Philemon. He's the one who was betrayed. He lost money. Had to run the, just deal with the aftermath after Onesimus left and what he tells people and what happened. He has to forgive Philemon has to forgive Onesimus for betraying him and stealing from him, costing him the loss he incurred. But this is also difficult for Onesimus, right? I mean, think about the risk he's taking. Paul is telling Onesimus, you need to go back. You need to go all the way back to Colossae and make things right. This is risky for Onesimus. Commentators have pointed out that this is reminiscent of the story, the parable of the prodigal son. He returns to his father whom he left. He returns to his father, but is at the complete mercy of the father. Onesimus is at the complete mercy of Philemon, right? As to how he's going to deal with him. Onesimus doesn't know. He knows what Paul told him, but he doesn't know that Philemon's actually going to do that. See, the situation is full of personal hurt. It's full of fear, embarrassment. But the truth is, don't we all have our own stories and situations of personal hurt? Haven't all of us experienced some kind of broken relationship and the aftermath is full of fear? The aftermath is embarrassing. Whether you are the Onesimus in this story, the one who hurt someone else, Or maybe you're Philemon, you're the one who was betrayed. We all can relate. How do we deal with that? How can we forgive each other? How can we navigate these emotions and these fears that arise when we are wronged or when we have hurt someone else? 
There's only one way. We'll deal more, we'll deal more with this and the conflict between Onesimus and Philemon next week, but, but here's what we need to see today. Here's what we need to see to set the stage for next week when we see reconciliation. You see, the key, the key to unlocking the great secret to the path to forgiveness and reconciliation is found in verse 18 and 19. This is it. This is good. Pay attention. Listen here. Look on the screens. Verse 18 and 19. Paul tells Philemon what? He says, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Boy, that is bold, <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of crazy, really. I mean, do you see? Do you see what Paul is offering to do here? He says, hey man, whatever Onesimus took from you, I will fit the bill. I'm going to repay it. Penny for penny, I will do it. And that's shocking. But Paul deeply believed and was convinced that forgiveness isn't free. It is costly for everyone involved. He is offering to pay Onesimus' debt on his behalf. That's a big deal. The NIV Study Bible notes that whatever Onesimus did or stole, it cost fine even financially. It brought dishonor to him. And now Paul is saying, whatever the offense... Whatever the offense, charge it to my account. I want to pay for it because I love Onesimus and I love you, Philemon, and I want him to be reconciled to you. Verse 12, listen to the language Paul uses. He says, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. And here's why that should resonate with Philemon. Here's, that why, here's why that should resonate with you today. Because guess what? That is exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. We betrayed. We betrayed our master. We betrayed our God. We tried to, to steal his glory from him. God created us to be in relationship with him, to love him, to give ourselves fully and completely to our creator. And we said, no, I want to glorify myself. I'm going to pull from you, God, and I want to just turn that spotlight off of you and put it on me. I want to make the decisions in my life. I want to run the show. I want to be my own authority, and I want people to see how great I am. So... I'll keep you on the side, and when I need you, I'll call you. But right now, I want the attention. Oh, we stole from our master. We stole from our creator, God. We betrayed him. We ran away. And that put us in debt to him forever, a debt that we could not pay. We could never repay on our own. So like Onesimus, what do we do? We run away. We try to go as far as we can away from God, spiritually speaking, and hide we hide in our shame. We hide in fear of returning to him. We think that he will deal harshly with us. But then what happens in your life? God orchestrates a Paul to come into your life. God orchestrates somebody to come into your life, someone or some means of you hearing the good news of Jesus. And it comes to your life. God orchestrates that moment. And you know where it is. If you've trusted Christ to be your Savior, you know. You know who it was, or you know the moment of your life, at least the season of your life, where God was working in your heart. He was doing things that would lead you to truth. And he opened your eyes. And we hear the good news that Jesus himself stepped into our mess, into our debt. Jesus himself stepped into our betrayal, into the debt we owed God, and said, don't punish her. Don't punish him. Charge it to my account. 
That's exactly what Jesus did for us. When Jesus died on the cross, that's what he was doing. He was taking the debt that we owed God, putting it on himself. The penalty of sin was bearing down on Jesus' body, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, all in those ways. Jesus was just taking the impact of our betrayal on himself so that God's wrath would not have to fall on you. It was a true substitution. Jesus died for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God, so that our sins could be forgiven, so they could be paid for. And in return, he gives us his goodness. He gives us his record of perfection and righteousness that is credited to our account. So even though we struggle as we follow Jesus for the rest of our days on this earth, ultimately God sees us as holy and pure in Christ because it's Christ's record in your place. Look at verse 13 and 14 of Colossians chapter 2. Paul says it very clearly. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You see, the key to understanding how you can forgive someone who's wronged you, the key to understanding how you can approach someone that you've wronged and ask for their forgiveness It is not easy. It is extremely costly to you, to them. But look at the cost. Look at the cost that Jesus paid. At infinite cost, he gave his life so that we could be forgiven. How can we not forgive others? As we have been forgiven, so we must forgive. Jesus paid that infinite cost, the price of his life. He was separated from God the Father in the darkness of the cross so that we would be freed from our slavery to sin and adopted into his family forever. You see, this is why Paul believed forgiveness and reconciliation were actually possible. He really did. No matter who did it, no matter what was said, no matter what was done, no matter how hurt you feel, Because if you follow Jesus, you have already experienced the greater forgiveness that nothing on this earth could compare to. Because if you follow Jesus, forgiveness and reconciliation defines who you are. And that's what's been done for you already in the greater way. So next week, more on that topic. How we work this out, how we actually forgive one another. But right now, my question for you is simple. Have you Have you accepted God's grace and forgiveness for your sins? Not the person that wronged you. I'm not, we're not thinking there. That's next week. No, right now for you, have you accepted God's grace and forgiveness for your betrayal against him? Have you run to him and said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I have treated you. I'm sorry that I tried to steal your glory. I'm sorry that I think I can handle things on my own. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Would you forgive me of my sins? I want to love you. I want to follow you. I don't even really know how to do all those things right now, but I just know that I want to be yours. Do you believe the gospel is really that powerful for you, for others in your lives? Do you believe you need other Christians Are you too prideful to think you don't need other Christians in your life? Do you believe that you need other Christians in your life to walk alongside you, to encourage you? Paul did. May we believe the same. Forgiveness is costly, but it's worth it.